So uh, I was told that I was told that this guy needs love. He's the guy that is here every year, and he needs to come by. And I would ask you, Patrick, to please give him some love. <laughs> Turn the cameras off. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm Mike. So uh, when you submit the speaker, they ask you for uh, do you have any special requirements? And I said I need a hug. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever coordinates that actually put that on Patrick's calendar. <laughs> Hug at Johnny Xmas, it's pretty funny. Uh, so who's seen me present here before? Cool, I know you guys have, because you came up and asked if I'm drunk again this time. <laughs> we'll let you guys find out. Uh, how many pen testers we have in the audience? That's, that's more than most. How many, um, how many blue teamers who do pen testing as part of their role? <laughs> well, this is, uh, we're going to fix that today. That's the whole purpose of this. So, um, moving on. That's me. The guy who looks like me is me. Uh, I know uh, a lot of these slides are going to be hard to read because the screens are kind of small. Don't worry about it. I put all the slides up on my GitHub. There's going to be tons of information anyway that I just wouldn't be able to go through. So definitely, uh, I'll have a link to the GitHub at the bottom. Uh, the final slide, so definitely go grab those and review them. It'll have links to all the tools I mentioned um, and all the text for pretty much everything. So don't worry too much about not being able to read the slides. Uh, real quick about me, I'm Johnny Exmus. Uh, I'm currently a security researcher for a company called Uptake, uh, where we're doing um, secret stuff <laughs> uh, in the industrial control systems vertical. Uh, we're we're going to be releasing something really, really, really cool really soon. Uh, so that's all I can say about that. The upside is like, I get to be a security researcher, which is like, you know how everybody wants to be a pen tester, right? Like, how many of you pen testers get asked daily? Like, oh man, how do I get to be a pen tester? What should I do to be a pen tester? All the pen testers I know, like, we want to be security researchers because you just get to sit like in a little box and just hack at stuff all day and not have to report to anybody. So that's what I do now. So I have, I have my dream job of being a security researcher. But before that, I was a penetration tester. And I was a penetration tester uh, for a consulting firm which is like the worst. Who here's a pen tester for a consulting firm? Yeah, it's it's not great. Like you don't work anywhere. Every client you have treats you like dirt because you're not actually an employee of them. Um, they don't listen to you because they don't know who you are and you're just some guy who's telling them they have to spend a lot of money and they think you're trying to just get them to spend more money and they don't believe you and it's just a terrible gig. Uh, before that, I was a, a security engineer for uh, Office Max. So, Fortune 500, Global 1000 company, just de engineering defensive systems for them. I'd say that was probably like my first like real infosec job. I missed that a lot. Security engineering was fun. Um, everybody would ask me like, oh, how do I be a pen tester like you? I'm like, man, I just miss being an engineer. Like maybe go back and do that. That's where all the fun was. Like orchestration, automation, orchestration, automation, orchestration, automation. And then you're out of a job. It's the best. <laughs> Um, I'm a founder and coordinator for Verbsec, which is, who's heard of Verbsec? Like, I go to other countries and there's always like a few. Um, Verbsec is, um, I like to say that I don't have the stats for it, but uh, it's, I'm pretty sure it's the most well-attended information security meetups in the U.S. Uh, we're based out of Chicago. We have four of them. We meet weekly. Um, and our largest ones get 40 to 70 consistent uh, attendees, and so it's really really cool, uh, and I'm also a guy who speaks at times. Um, who's seen me speak anywhere? Yeah, I've been, uh, I think this is, I'm approaching like number 70 now for presentations I've done in like my sixth country. So this is really just what I do. I hang out here and I talk to people. So uh, moving on, I'm here because I got bored as a pen tester. Um, I would go to company after company and I would find the same stupid garbage wrong at every company. I would run the same attacks at every company, get in the same way, get DA the same way, be done in maybe two days for a 40-hour engagement, have to figure out how to rewrite the same report for the 80th time because 
the company was really against, like, no, you can't just copy and paste your reports and give them to a new company. You have to write something custom for the current client. And you can't write the same report for the same client that you did last year, which is like, that makes sense. But like, why would you ha do that in the first place? Because they didn't fix anything. <laughs> and yet, they're having you still come back and do a pen test. And like, the first thing I do as a pen tester when I'm like on a recurring engagement is I go get my old report and I go, all right, let me try these things first. And most of them would still work. And I go, why am I here? It's, well, we're required to do a pen test every year for, for you know, PCI compliance. Do you understand why? <laughs> well, PCI compliance doesn't say we have to remediate, we just have to have done a pen test. <laughs> Good rub. And so it got boring. It's, it, it was so ultra repetitive. You just go in every day, do the same thing, fall asleep for the rest of the week, write your report the next week. And like it was cool because at least, you know, you get a few days off every week. Like, <laughs> Who doesn't want to work 16 hour weeks and get a full salary? That's fantastic. Uh, you get bored. You get cabin fever sitting at home all day doing nothing. Uh, and so a lot of people would think that answer was weird. Like, oh, I don't get to be a pen tester. And then I give them the like, dude, you don't want to be. It's terrible. Um, being a pen tester for a company like full time is really cool. If you work for a company and you're on their internal red team, that's when you like are forced to keep learning and keep finding new shit uh, because You've already done the old shit, and you've worked to help them remediate that. And you get to watch the, you know, you get to see the fruits of your labor and feel like you're accomplishing something. Versus when you're a consultant, uh, you tell them what to do in your report, and then sometimes you never see that company again. And for all you know, like the shit's just still broken. Sometimes I check. <laughs> it's almost always still broken. So um, what I put together for you here is... Uh, a talk on all of that like cheater, pen tester bullshit that I would do right out of the gate that would get me in every single time. So that you guys as defensive engineers or what have you can take this back and remediate all the things that I take advantage of in this talk so that you're then ready to have a pen tester come in and actually provide you with something valuable versus them just wrecking your shit and giving you the finger and leaving because your stuff was so easy. So a lot of the pen testers are going to be really mad that you're doing this. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, how a magician never reveals his secrets. And then back in the 90s, Fox had this running series where they had a magician who would reveal all the magician's secrets. Like, oh, here's how we saw the lady in half and all that. And all the magicians got super pissed at him for, like, giving their secrets away. But his deal was, like, stop doing the saw the lady in half trick. Like, it's dumb. Invent your own thing. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm taking all the dumb things, going, here's how they work. Now you're all protected against it. Now you can have a pen tester come in and he's actually going to be worth the money you're spending on. Uh, but first, let's talk a little bit about how pen testers actually go about uh, their job. There's actually a framework. It's not just uh, come in and just start poking around and hope you find something to have. There's, there's a process uh, that you follow for that. And everyone's kind of got their own. Um, certain companies have their own process that they require everyone to follow, but a lot of them kind of revolve around or exactly use this penetration testing execution standard. Uh, that's at pentest-standard.org. Again, you can download all my slides later and find this stuff. Um, this is an incredibly in-depth standard that was created by a lot of huge names in the penetration testing and information security field to just kind of make sure that everyone's doing a very thorough job with the pen test. Uh, and generally how it works is you come in and how do I do the clicking? See, <laughs> computers. Uh, <laughs> um, see, you come in and you start doing a lot of your passive looking around. You see what there is to see. You start in, you know, investigating the perimeter. You're looking elsewhere on the internet for information about the company. You're trying to build yourself your attack plan. Um, and then you move, once you've got your attack plan, you've identified, like, here are the weak points. Here's what I'm going to try to attempt against those weak points. Like, that's when you move into the exploitation phase and start actually actively doing things. Uh, and this is where, this is your, mainly your greatest risk of getting caught hangs out around here. Uh, and then once you've exploited something to allow yourself to get access into the company or greater access that you have, then you move into this post-exploitation phase. Uh, and that is um, where you're, you're in a new place and you're like, all right, what's here? What, what can I get from here? How do I get from here to where I want to go? And it kind of goes in this circle uh, where you're, you're back to your intelligence gathering again. Go back to that. No, Computers. So it kind of goes in the circle like this, where you go intelligence gathering, exploitation, post-exploitation, 
intelligence gathering again, because now you're in a new place. I'm inside of a new computer. Is there something that this new computer can see that the old computer I was inside of couldn't? Are there ACLs in place? Are there documents in the computer I can use? You're going to search for things like lists of passwords, which you find all the time. <laughs> Just plain text on the desktop. Like You don't even have to really look. Like You can search for the phrase password and find these things. And you laugh, and it seems silly, but it's just incredibly common. Uh, so uh, that, that's what I generally use myself. Um, one big thing that I think I find a lot of defensive people don't realize is that um, the reason your blinky box technology and endpoint protection and stuff doesn't work that well is because hackers aren't using the things that that stuff defends against. We're using the things that are already in the systems. We're just using PowerShell. We're using WMI. We're using SMB. We're using Windows itself and just like passing commands around. We're using legitimate users. We're logging in as actual users with their credentials and acting like that user. All of that stuff is not something that, you know, the money you spend on defensive technology is really going to be great at finding, especially if you're just pulling it out of the box uh, and setting it up and going. Um, they just, like, they're not made to work against legitimate activities like that. Um, we don't, we often don't use Kali. Um, Kali is great as a defensive engineer if you just need an infosec toolkit to pull up and start, like, launching attacks because you want to test if you're immediate, something or whatever. It's totally fine. Generally, it's, it's wonky. It's not a great daily driver operating system. Um, personally, what I do is I just, my go-to is just a Debian install with a, a couple of tools that I use. It's like, 10 tools, maps, because I don't need the 4,000 things that are inside of Gally. Uh, and then once you're inside a company, um, you're not spinning up a Kali VM on their ESXi host. You can. I've seen people do it. It's just the most retarded thing you could ever do. <laughs> Kali is the noisiest operating system. It's funny because it's like, oh, the quieter you become is the big tagline. It's noisy as hell. Like, Kali announces itself on the network in every which way possible. Like, if somebody spins up Kali in a network, you should be able to immediately to, uh, identify it and shut it down. Um, so we're not doing that. We're just we're taking advantage of the computers that are already there. We're just living off the land. On occasion, we will launch some malware. That's an absolute last resort if living off the land just didn't work. Uh, and even then, we're likely crafting our own malware on the fly. Um, so there's no signatures out there for it. Like, sometimes heuristics will pick it up, sometimes it won't. Um, sometimes we're just using PowerShell malware, which, like, nothing catches for some reason. Like, everything's just terrible at grabbing anything PowerShell-based. So, pro tip, uh, start looking for PowerShell being exploited in your environment. Uh, so, first phase we touch on is the recon. Like I said, this is, this is where we're trying to figure out what's going on with this company. We're starting from outside, by the way. Uh, and just determine what our plan of attack is. Um, one of my favorite things to use is, of course, a tool that I wrote called ScanCannon. Uh, this is uh, a cool combination of Nmap and MassScan. Who's know, who knows MassScan? Cool. MassScan is super fun. Um, I wrote ScanCannon scan for the purpose of enumerating the external uh, environments of huge companies. This is for somebody who has, you know, like a Class B uh, on the internet something just gargantuan and with a lot of active IPs, uh, a lot of domain names, a lot of stuff you want to investigate. Uh, this goes through and it not only enumerates all that, just like Nmap would, but it creates this whole folder structure full of really interesting stuff, um, full of lists of just IPs, lists of domains that you can easily point other tools at and keep going and script around. Uh, it's up on my GitHub, it's called ScanCannon. I like it a lot, I keep using it. Um, props to Kate for helping me with all of the off awesomeness that's built in the scan cannon. Uh, so I like to use that with the larger corporations. With smaller ones, you don't need something like this. Uh, and in fact, it might, uh, it might get in your way. You, might, you have a, a great potential of actually dosing a company's external infrastructure with using um, the mass scan that's built into here. Um, we actually, we ended up taking, accidentally taking out our ISP's router at one point while we were testing it, which is funny. Um, with, from just like a single endpoint which is crazy. It's like 1990s again, where you can do that from one AP. Uh, so ScanCan is going to help you like enumerate what's out there. Um, what, what are we looking for? What's, what's the low-hanging fruit in the company's externally facing garbage? FTP, sure. WordPress, but, but why? What's it going to get you? A shell on, yeah, hopefully you're going to get a shell. 
Uh, hopefully, that that, sh that shell is going to have uh, going to allow you access further into the network and not just be ACL off and then you only got that server. Hopefully, that server is going to have uh, AD connections to it. Because like what we want here, we, we're looking for anything that, that works with AD, anything that uses AD to authenticate, uh, which could be FTP, which could be something on that WordPress server. I mean, I hope not, but it happens. Um, we're looking for OA. OA is my absolute favorite. Outlook web, web app, just that's the best because it's right there. Um, what else I got up here? I got RDP. RDP is a huge one. This one's RDP. Who uses Shodan? the internet scavenger hunt tool. Shodan's super fun. Go home and use Shodan for no reason. <laughs> it's the best, like, it's better than like surfing 4chan. You find like the most <laughs> emotionally frustrating shit just using Shodan, and it's really easy. Um, this is a, I just did a quick, all I did was search for remote desktop, and I got 2.7 million hits. This is on the internet. This is 2.7 million RDP posts, like listening for RDP, just waiting for a login on the internet like that I can get to from my house. Actually, I think I did that from here, maybe? It doesn't matter. Um, up here, Outlook Web App, I think there's like 48,000 just hanging out. It's some company stuff. Um, VPN, VPN is an awesome one, especially if it has an HTTP front end for it, because a lot of times they'll leak the VPN group name to you because they just give you this drop down box. So but, and overall, we're looking for AD connected logins that we can use to determine if we can figure out a user's password because if you've got an AD set of AD credentials, you're in. That's great. That gets you so far into the company. Versus like you don't want a website that has like a customer portal because then you're just getting customer credentials, and those generally that's not going to help you for what you're trying to do here. Um, that's just for playing around and fun on its own. So main, we're looking for AD connected logins with no multi-factor protections on them. That's the big thing. It's pretty much like if you got two-factor, that 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 shoots us in both feet. Like that's the worst. Oftentimes, we'll just give up on that. We'll be like, no, this is not, they got two-factor there, move on, where else can we get in? So, like, first and foremost, it should be using two-factor. Most people aren't. I can't understand this, like, how you have something that auths to AD on the internet, that you put on the internet, like OA, with no, no multi-factor up. It's, it's just fucking baffling. Uh, and so, like, that's, that's what we're trying to do here. Um, so, what do we need for those AD logins? What do we need to get past those? Shout it out, it's going to get really boring. Credits, we need credits. What are credits? What are the two parts of credit? Username and password. So, like, where do we find usernames? The, in, yeah. the internet. <laughs> yeah, so um, one of my personal favorites is hunter.io. That's the, the, the domain name, hunter.io. Uh, and it's free, and he. You can go in there and you just type in a company domain name that you're looking for, and it will just, I think for Google.com, yeah, maybe 13,000 or 14,000 email addresses. Um, what's cool about email addresses is uh, Exchange Web Services can use those as valid usernames. Um, also, it's often really easy to reverse those into valid usernames based off the address. So we're looking for usernames or addresses. I mean, other places you can use uh, data.com is a great one. Um, data.com is really great because I see a lot of immoral pen testers who will go like dump a company's uh, entire AD uh, stack of email addresses and then upload them to data.com because data.com is like gamified. It gives you credits and the more credits you have, the more stuff you can get off of them. And so these pen testers will like take the results of one of their like pen tests, take this like restricted corporate information and just upload it to data.com. So there's a ton of stuff on it that's from other pen testers. So if you're looking for a company, try that. Hunter.io, probably the same thing. It's really cool. Um, and so that's going to get you email addresses. Uh, there's a tool called Foca out there. Who's used Foca? Uh, I really like Foca. It has not been updated in a long time. It doesn't really seem to need to be. What Foca, the, the really the only great part about Foca that still works anymore uh, is the document scraping portion. You point this at a domain, it hunts down all related servers to that domain. It tries to hunt down other servers like with subdomains under that domain. And then you get it to pull a ton of documents. Uh, and then what, why do we need these documents? What's in these, what's in these documents? That's great. Metadata. Metadata, exactly. Metadata, uh, such as usernames. So you go, you grab all these documents. I mean, it's rare you're gonna find a document that actually has anything useful inside of the actual text because it's usually just marketing materials or something like that. 
the metadata is what you want. It not only links usernames, but it links uh, network locations, it gives you server names, it gives you workstation names, it gives you work uh, workstation fingerprints sometimes. With enough documents, you can really start to fingerprint the inside of a company without having to actually ever even breach the perimeter. And you're just doing passive things like not just downloading stuff that they host on the internet. That's not really going to flag anything other than like, hey, somebody just downloaded all 17,000 documents we host publicly. Maybe that's something we should flag on. You laugh, nobody flags on that. So let's go through how to defend against that. Um, for the service scans, like the scanners, A, it's really, really easy to get your SEM to alert on somebody who's doing a massive scan like that. Um, that that shouldn't shouldn't be anything I have to talk about. In fact, I have to imagine like every SEM out there just might have fallen out of the box as alerts for like an NMAP scan, um, especially if it's uh, you know a ton of connections are coming from the same IP. Like that's weird. A ton of connections to different ports in the same IP. There's, a, there's like a thousand rules you can write on that. Super easy. Um, make sure that what you have out there is what you want to have out there. You should be running these tools and finding, finding what's running out there. I mean, how many people have to deal with like shadow IT as a daily part of their job? Like, that's a huge problem with security is like, where the fuck did this server come from now? What is this? Why is there an open FTP server with like guest accounts enabled that wasn't here yesterday? You should have that level of, of information on, on your uh, network. You should be able to know if something popped up that wasn't there yesterday. You should be running these tools and anything you find that's weird, you should be remediating. Like it's not all about just like vulnerability management. It's about like asset management. You can like reduce your attack surface greatly by just looking at it and going, these 70,000 things don't have to be here. This system doesn't need to have all of these services listening when we only use it for that. That's huge. Just reducing your attack surface is incredibly frustrating and a great thing you can do. Um, be running Shodan and Foca and Googling yourself. Download your own documents that you guys are hosting. See what metadata is in them. Like I'm finding usernames from documents from 2003, and so what? That user probably doesn't even work there anymore, and that account's probably not valid. But and the metadata you can garner from the username is valid because it tells you the username format that the company uses. Then you can go back and take all the emails from that company you grabbed and likely assemble a username from that's usually like you know first initial last name something like that really great defense against that is don't use usernames that are derived from anything your usernames should could be just like random letters and numbers or something like that you know an employee id number and then a letter at the end defining like what the state of the account is or whatever um that that's a huge one i don't i rarely find that and when i do it pisses me off because it's like there's no way that i can even like enumerate usernames like if, but if i know that your username method is first initial last name i can crank out a ton of usernames just by guessing a smith b smith c smith d smith r smith like how many of those are probably valid how many how many probably have an a smith one a smith five it's common names so like if you're building usernames in your environment that are based off of something that's easily discernible don't like stop i know that's a huge thing to have to fix but it's a huge thing. It's like network segmentation. It's a big pain in the ass, but it, like, it stops a major attack that I use constantly. Um, and so then once you've got everything cleaned up, you know what's out there, start writing alerts around it to like identify anomalous activity based on how that stuff should be accessed. And then write alerts for weird, weird ways of accessing that, such as like, yeah, downloading three documents from the web from your website, not a big deal. Downloading 17, weird, alert on that. Just easy stuff like that. Um, there's a, who's used this program, Recon NG? I call the pen testers in the front row. <laughs> Recon NG is really cool because it finds more stuff than just like documents with metadata. Um, it goes looking out to all sorts of places like LinkedIn and Pastebin and uh, it looks at the PGP system. It starts looking for usernames, email addresses, and keys, like PGP keys, um, SSH keys. It finds all sorts of cool crap. Um, Scrape pastebin. You guys should be like constantly scraping pastebin, looking for your company's data in it, because pastebin is an awesome resource for for company data, uh, and also malware. Uh, there's another talk here. I'm finding obfuscated malware just by scraping pastebin. Like if you want free malware, you can code like pastebin. But also like if you want company's internal information, pastebin. You should just be searching for your company name, company name, and variations on your company name on pastebin. 
daily, hourly, whatever. That should be a really easy thing you can scrape. Uh, definitely do that. Um, you can have legal, if you have legal at your company, you can have them issue takedowns to like data.com and under .io and say, hey, please remove our information to the site. And generally those sites comply with it, but it's just going to end up back there. Um, there's the really, like, overall, there's nothing you can do. Like, your stuff is on the internet. That's how it is. All of our stuff's on the internet. So, really, you just have to be working to defend against that known scenario. And you should be able to. You should have IR in place. You should have a plan for, like, okay, what happens if our entire email address list gets dumped? What do we do then? You should already know. You should already know that. If you, or you should already be doing that. You should be operating under the assumption that that's the case, because it very likely is. Uh, and sorry, I'm like I'm pushing through this because our time's obviously limited. If you guys want to ask me questions afterwards, I'll be around, no problem. But I'm just going to blow through this for now. So now we've got uh, we've identified our targets, which is basically our uh, our login windows that accept AD credentials. We've got some usernames we've created. Um, now we're going to try to log in. But what else do we need? We got we got targets and we have usernames. What's missing there? Passwords. What do we do for passwords? We psychically deduce that. <laughs> so, live demo, psychic deduction. I'm going to transmit all of the most used passwords in all of your company's environments right now into the next slide. I need absolute quiet for this. Oh, uh, there they are. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> eh? did I do it? I got one clap. I'm psychic. So, like, I know this is hard for a lot of you to read. Um, you hear this all the time. Like, I've got like this crap over here that's like season and year. You know, spring 2017 or just spring 17. <laughs> fall 17 exclamation point. And we all go, yeah, we know those are bad passwords. That's the joke. It's a running gag on the internet that people use those passwords. It's a running gag because people use those passwords. <laughs> this, this, is, I, this is consistent. This isn't like, I'm going to try these first and it probably won't work and then I'll move on. I almost always get at least two hits off of just this first column. And that's all you need. Like, we all know the pen tester gag, like, all you need is one. That, like, I get two. <laughs> um, password, password one, he, insanely common. You know who uses password one? Your fucking help desk. <laughs> they get, they tell, they set everyone's, you know, when you call in, you're like, I lost my password because I'm really drunk. They set, they set it to password one a lot. Or they set it to company name one a lot. Or they set it to something the company does one exclamation point a lot. Um, this is a this this one at the top here is something from uh, Chris Nickerson who tipped me off. Um, fuck company name is a super common password. <laughs> People think they're cute, like yeah, fuck this company, I'm gonna set my password and fuck IBM. <laughs> I'm going to guess that. I get a lot of hits on that one. So I heard Chris talk about that in one of his talks, and I'm like, that can't be. And I, but I just added it to my like default. Like, I have a top 25 word list. Like, my word list is 25 to 30 words. That's it. And I always get hits on it. Uh, the other one is, uh, like, something the company does. If you work for an insurance company, your default help desk password might be insurance one or insure one or something like that. Or, you know, if you work for a catering company, it might be catering one or catering 2017. Um, there's a really cool tool called QL, C-E-W-L, who's used QL to generate word lists. Um, QL is awesome because you just point it at a company's website, like their promotional website with all their marketing garbage, and you say, like, give me every word from this website that is more than eight characters. And it'll go through and give you a bunch of words. And like based off of that, you can tell what the company does. And you can make a really good educated guess about what, which of those words the help desk is probably using to reset passwords. Um, what's really cool is the help desk will like reset their own passwords to like this shit and never change it. And you know, like who has some of the most dangerous privileges in your environment is the help desk. And these are also the often like the least experienced members of your IT team. And we're giving them the most access to everything because they need it because they're the help desk to fix things. 
Um, they just have the worst passwords for themselves. And I don't know if it's because they're not experienced or what, but like I almost always end up cracking help desk passwords, like right out of the gate. It's not even cracking, it's guessing. It's just like, let's type it in and see. So like, I'm gonna go through with, uh, I can use Burp. Who uses Burp Suite as part of their daily job? You absolutely should. This is an awesome, awesome proxy tool. It's great for just troubleshooting. Like forget brute forcing. It's great for figuring out why your crap's just not working. Or like really someone else's crap not working and they're blaming security and then you bust open Burp Suite and you go, no, that's, this is your dumbass. Here's security and here's you and this is the broken part. <laughs> um, but like for just brute forcing um, HTTP logins like OA, oh, uh, Burp Suite's great. You just give it usernames, passwords, click go, go get a sandwich, come back and you're gonna get at least two hits off of season year, some some form of that. So uh, that's fantastic. Use Burp Suite. I really love it. Um, another great one. Who's who's used Mail Sniper? This one is vicious. Um, Mail Sniper was put up uh, by Black Hills. I want to say DerbyCon 2016. Um, and uh, the dude who wrote it discovered that in most cases, when you have uh, OS set up in Office 2010, Office 2013, all the way through Office six, uh, 365 at the end of it. Uh, it looks like either patching 365 or he was wrong. Um, it also stands up this like EWS service, Exchange Web Services. And that's like an API that non-Microsoft stuff can use to also interface with your Exchange environment. Like if you write your own custom app for your, your people to check your email, like I don't know why I heard you would do that. That's like rolling your own crypto. But like, it's a thing and it's always stood up. And um, in most environments, you can't just shut it off because it's going to break something. Uh, like I recently discovered that uh, Outlook for Mac uses EWS to log in, the Exchange Web Services, which is bananas. Like it uses like the app API instead of like the same stuff that all the other Microsoft products do. So like if you kill EWS, you're just going to, you're, you're going to disconnect all your Mac users. So it's a really difficult thing uh, to fix. Uh, but what Mail Sniper does is it just uses that back end to log in, it can use email addresses as valid usernames, so you don't even have to worry about discerning what the actual usernames in the environments are. Um, and, and this is fucking devastating, you cannot apply multi-factor authentication to it. You cannot. Microsoft does not have a means of doing that. So they, even if you have your Outlook web app uh, multi-factor, if you have Exchange web services exposed to the internet, that's pointless. I mean, it's not going to still definitely do it because you're going to defend against a lot of bots. Um, but like, you can bypass multi-factor with Mail Sniper. Do it. Try it. I do it all the time. It's crazy. That should have gotten more gasps or lose an eye. Um, I think everybody's terrified that I just told them their two-factor doesn't work on like one of their major AD logins. <laughs> um, and then like failing all of that. Like if I just cannot get a hit, if I cannot get creds to save my life through any of this, through one reason or another, um, we will off, we'll resort to phishing. Phishing is cheater bullshit uh, because it always works. <laughs> always works. Phishing has never, ever failed. And the bigger your organization, the more it works. Just statistically, it's fantastic. Um, so like just, I don't have to tell you how phishing works. Everyone here knows how phishing works. Uh, the tool I really, they, oh, so this is the face that all of us make when a user sends in an email like, is this phishing? Is this legit? You're like, yeah! Are you kidding me? Um, tool I really like, it's open and free, it's called Fierce Fish. It's really legit for something that's open and free. You can totally use this to fish internally. Um, it's also great, like, if you're an attacker and you just want to be able to keep track of the 14,000 people you're currently fishing to see who did what, and you can set up campaigns, just fish for creds. And generally what I like to do is just fish for creds. Um, I don't like to send out malware uh, because you got a high chance of endpoint protection actually flagging on that, and then they're gonna trace it back to you and then problems start. I like to just fish for creds, send people to a company looking website that asks them to log in with their credentials, make sure that it then you know redirects them to something valid that is what they're expecting, and you get a very low chance of them actually reporting it to the help desk. Uh, I mean, even I found like when they do report it to the, to the help desk, sometimes help desk is like, no, that's legit. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that totally looks like this site that I know they were working on. That's, don't worry about it, it's fine. And then they throw out all the other like alerts that come in. So like, 
and great job help desk. But you tell your help desk to do it because like otherwise you're going to DOS your security team because you're going to get 60 of these a day. Whose security team is responsible for like validating phishing attempts? Like, isn't that like annoying? Because you just get garbage. The every, every one you see, you don't even have to do like forensics on it. You're just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those aren't even words. <laughs> this guy wrote this using all numbers. Uh, fun fact about that, like when you get those really bad phishing attempts from like Nigeria, and you're like, who, 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 who thinks that this would work? Like not who falls for this, but who thought someone would fall for this? Um, this is dumb, this is a bad spammer. What a lot of those people are actually doing is trying to find the really slow targets. <laughs> they're, they're just fishing out who's gonna fall for the more complicated stuff based on who falls for the crap, crappy stuff. So when you see those emails come through, you're often going to see another one come through. Like if you clicked on the link or whatever, that's, it's often not even malicious. It sometimes doesn't go anywhere. All it does is just ping back to their server and goes, got to hit, hit, that's it. Um, it's doing that to keep track of who's dumb. And then they compile this list of really dumb people. <laughs> and then that list gets targeted with the, with the severe shit. Uh, so like, don't. Don't think that that's nothing. If you see the really bad phishing emails come through, that could be something. Take it seriously, figure out where it came from, do your IR, you know, block it, we'll do whatever you gotta do. Uh, but be aware that it may be uh, the beginning of a more targeted attack against your company. Um, what you can do to protect against phishing, like I said, the thing that always works, now I'm gonna tell you how to make it not work, even though it always works. Um, awareness training, like, Everyone should be doing awareness training. I know we all hate awareness training. I know all awareness training is corny. Um, users don't like it. Most users don't even pay attention to it. They just click through as fast as possible and guess at the quiz at the end until that they get it. <laughs> like you're, you're, you're helping somebody. Like if you educate one more user in your environment with something they weren't aware of, you did something. It's useful. Like awareness training does not work that well, but it does do something. Um, you should absolutely be fishing yourselves. Whose company fishes themselves? That's super low. You guys should all be fishing your own employees at least quarterly and making all, all the employees know it and posting the results. Maybe not like publicly shaming the people who failed. <laughs> which will, uh, in America, that'll get you in a lot of freaking trouble. Um, but like just posting the results. Like, hey, here's how good we did as a company for fishing. And don't let them know when you're running the campaign. Just let them know, like, hey, last week we did it. Here's the results. You guys are doing way better than you were uh, the previous month. Uh, make sure you're doing positive and negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is the easy one. The positive one is what I see nobody doing, and it's weird because that's the most effective way of uh, setting up an anti-phishing, uh, just like an awareness culture with you and your, your, your companies. Um, I'll touch on this real quick. Like, does, does, does HR in your company actually enforce your acceptable use policy? Like if somebody does something that ends up in their system being compromised, that is directly against the AUT, like do they get written up in your companies? Has anyone like seen anyone get fired for that? One, two, three, three. Yeah, it's a huge problem. Like nobody has HR support for this stuff because HR doesn't even take it seriously. And HR is the one who like collects half of your really secretive data and they don't give a shit. Uh, and that's, that's why phishing works. You're, it's not that users are dumb. Stop using that as an excuse. You're dumb. Don't play the users. It's that they don't give a shit. And that's a totally different scenario. They don't have ownership of it. It's because it's not their email box. It's their work's email box. It's the email box they use for work. It's not their information that's being compromised. It's the company's. And they're not really attached to the company anyway. Like, unless you, have, you work in like one of the top 20 best companies in Canada or whatever, your employees probably don't give that much of a shit about what happens to the company. Especially if they work in IT. If the company goes under, they don't work somewhere else. Like, they don't give a shit. So you have to do something to make these users give a shit about what's happening and be more vigilant with security. Um, and I found consistently positive reinforcement for that works amazingly. Somebody turns in something that ended up being a targeted phishing scam that they caught. Give us $5 Starbucks gift card. Like, what's five bucks? I've seen plenty of security shops do that. Just like a $5 gift card. Uh, and it's like, 
night and day response with security awareness in this company. I had uh, one friend who was a VP at a healthcare company who had set up a positive reinforcement program. It was five dollars Starbucks gift card if you're the first one to report a phishing attempt against our company. Um, and these users got so vigilant that one day he gets woken up like 5 a.m. out of bed and they're like, hey, uh, we had somebody report that they found what appears to be uh, a listening device planted uh, underneath the ledge of a cabinet right next to your office door. Like somebody spotted that. Just, really? What? What? So now he's, he's up and like freaked out. He drives down to the office and goes, let's take a look at this listening device they found. And they give it to him. He looks and he goes, that's an ant trap. <laughs> and and the guy was like, oh shit, you're right. <laughs> Do I still get the gift card though? Because <laughs> like, you know, like, I found something. And he was like, yeah. Yeah, you get a five dollar. Like, yeah. Thanks for being that vigilant that you thought an ant trap was like an attack against their company. Like, it, it worked that well. And like, he probably spent less than a thousand dollars that entire year on just five dollar gift cards and like security culture in his company was immediately flipped on its head this works amazingly well time and time again it's absolutely the best thing you could do and the bottom line is you're trying to make the users just give a shit about their company and do something uh, and so like put money in their pocket that's how you make users give a shit um kate likes to do a thing with security awareness where she teaches them to take the things they learn there and apply it to their own email addresses their own personal information you know make sure you're using two-factor on your own gmail account and so like now that makes them care about their own stuff and they're just going to kind of apply that subconsciously to other gmail accounts that they're using such as if your work is using google apps it works really well because it makes them naturally just give a shit about what's going on and that's what's important so wrap that up it's not that they're dumb it's that they don't care and you got to fix that. Um, so to protect against like the, that sort of stuff, MFA all day, MFA all day. Like Google Authenticator is an absolutely free MFA solution if you guys use Google Apps at your work. Um, Duo Security is a relatively inexpensive solution that's, that's enterprise ready. Um, I don't work for them. I like their product. It's really neat. It's cheaper compared to RSA, which is like costs all of your money. Like however much money you have, it, they, you just write them a check for that, and that'll get you through the first year. Uh, and then all of their seeds get baked all the time. Uh, not all the time. Once every five years. Uh, and then like just like I could go through it. I bet everyone's room could invent uh, just an alert to write in your central deck against brute forcing because it's just like network scanning. It's like why are all these connections coming from the same five IPs? Why am I getting like this ocean of invalid user logins? Like, even though we're not locking the account out, like it's only trying each account once, twice, three times. Um, what, why is everyone failing for this period of time? Um, make sure you're doing lockouts. You know, even if it's like oh, five failed attempts in a 15-minute period, and then it unlocks 30 minutes later. At least, like, definitely make sure you're doing that. Uh, that's a really cool thing you can discern. Like, once you you got your one uh, set of creds, because their password was fall 17. Um, now, you can use that if you want to burn it, like usually you want to get two or three and then start burning them. You can burn that to determine what their lockout policy is. You can keep poking that until like you get success, or uh, keep poking it until like you can't log in with the valid creds anymore. So you do like three failed attempts and then log in, four failed attempts and then log in, and then five failed attempts and now it won't let you log in with the valid creds. That means you got locked out. Now you know the lockout policy. You can even start to time that out. And then once you have all that information, that metadata based around that policy, you can build your brute forcing system to comply with that and only try, you know, fail three times in a 15 minute period. Yeah, it's gonna take you a really long time to get a lot of passwords, but who cares? You're not sitting there doing it, the computer is. Set that up and then while that's going, go do something else. Because like sometimes the creds you got aren't, you know, they're gonna get you to like an admin for a nobody and it's not gonna get you anywhere because they don't have access to shit. Um, and while you're poking around with that, you're going to keep trying to get creds for some better accounts. Um, I don't think I need to go into detail on like what a good password is. We're all security people. I, I, I hope this isn't necessary. Um, oh, I, like username equals password? I see this all the time. Why is this happening in 2017? What is going on? Um, I see this for service accounts. Which is really funny because oftentimes like the, the username doesn't comply with the password policy, but an exception has been put in place 
for the service accounts, which is often really important. It has some kind of like elevated privileges, and now you let it have a really shitty password. Not just shitty because it gets to be shorter or have no special characters or whatever, but shitty because it's also the username. It makes me angry. Um, it, use more than 14 characters in your passwords. Your users should be doing this. Tell them to use complete sentences. That's what I always tell them. Like, use a whole sentence. Hi, my name is Fred, exclamation point, quotation marks. Like, easy to remember, super freaking hard to guess or crack. Like, that's fantastic. Um, uh, your, your, you enforce it. Your users are going to push back. They're going to get angry. They're going to forget their passwords a bunch initially. <laughs> Who cares? You have to push back and go, that's the policy now. And you need to get that support from the top down and go, that's the policy. Here's why. There's, I don't have to give you like the endless ocean of things you can cite to show that at least 14 characters uh, is where you should be at right now. Um, you should be doing your own password cracking in-house. Who's doing that? Who's cracking their own AD hashes? Five. Um, you, you should absolutely be doing that. Like Even if you're not cracking in-house, at least just like check for dupes. Just compare the hashes and check for dupes. See who's reusing passwords all over the place. Because you don't need to know the password, you just need to know the hash. And if you see the hash show up 20 times for a bunch of service accounts, you know you got a sysadmin who's being a lazy, uh, a lazy bastard. And it's just, I got a guy fired for that uh, as a pen tester. Like, I felt terrible. I got a sysadmin fired because he kept using shit passwords and doing things like that. And my third time around the company, they fired me for things that I kept finding. Um, so like your IT people are often, security people are the, the, the laziest with security. Your IT people are second laziest. Like we all think we're above the law. Or like, oh, I've got to get this done quick. I'm going to set all the passwords the same. I'll go back and change them later. And later ends up being 2020. <laughs> and now I've got all these dupes in there. Um, you don't need a gargantuan 60 GPU cracking rig to audit your passwords. Um, you could just do CPU cracking and use word lists. Like word lists are all over the internet. Just something, just something, you know. Even if it's just the 20 passwords I posted before and you're just looking for those, do, just do that. You should absolutely be auditing your passwords. So now that I've been able to log into like at least 60 accounts in your environment, um, I've breached the perimeter, I'm inside, I'm likely on a v, uh, VPN, because uh, that's usually what I do. Is once I got valid creds, I just get in through the VPN, because like I said, it's really easy to guess what the group name is. Um, if it's not even just your domain name. Uh, oh, by the way, like whose who's internal AD domain is the same as their external like domain? Like your website is company.com and your AD domain is company.com? Good, good on you for not raising your hand. Like I saw somebody who was like... <laughs> um, that's, a, that's, that's terrible. And I'll show you why in a second. Um, a makes like a guessing the domain to the AD login is really easy, but also there's plenty of tools that will do that for you. Like that's built into the, the OS spec. So when it does the NTLM exchange, it'll tell the client what the internal domain is. Um, so once I'm in and I'm on VPN, I'm on a LAN, and of course you don't have network segmentations. Nobody does that, right? The answer is yes, nobody does that. Um, it's awful. That's like one of the best things you can do is network segmentation to defeat an intelligent attacker. It's the worst. It's just, it's, I call it pen tester jail. You're just there and you're like, fuck, I can't even get anywhere. I'm so excited because I got in and I was stuck again. Segment your networks. Nobody does it. I know. It's hard. I don't want you to have to do hard stuff. I'm sorry. You know. Um, so the, one of the first things I do that's like absolute cheater bullshit is responder. Who's ran responder in their environment and been absolutely terrified as a result? Nobody's running responder. There's like another three. Uh, run responder. Responder just passively sits there listening for broadcasted requests for various services like WPAD and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, MDNS and all these services that like no enterprise needs ever, but like are on by default in like every you know Microsoft operating system ever, and we don't. We don't know that, and we don't think they're an issue, so we just let them keep going. And they're on there just like saying, "Hey, they're literally yelling, I would like to, I, I would like to log into something." Basically, they're just broadcasting over and over. And then so responder goes, "You can log into me." 
Uh, and then you can set it to actually let them do that. And they go, cool, thank you. And then it goes, yeah, just give me your NTLM hash. And it goes, here you go. And you go, thanks. Way to go, buddy. You're all set. And the computer's happy so the user doesn't get an alert because the computer's happy. And now I have these NTLM uh, V2 hashes. Um, they're net NTLM, though, so they're not like the kind that you can pass. Like, you can't use pass the hash with these to log into stuff. But what can you do with a bunch of password hashes? You can crack them. I know, it's just after lunch and well, I... <laughs> um, so you can crack them. And again, you don't need a gargantuan cracking rig to crack passwords. I was cracking passwords consistently on my Mac laptop sitting inside the office. And this thing doesn't even have like a GPU in it. I was just using a big word list and really I'm just fucking getting hits on Paul 17 some more. Uh, and you just, you just go to town with that. Now you've got a bunch more user accounts. Let's see what they do. Um, once you've got like these creds, you can, you can do things to get more creds too. Um, you can start attacking like SMB and WMI. Like, no, I don't know what's going on that like nobody thinks WMI is a big deal. Nothing like monitors WMI. Nobody's paying attention to like WMI logging. Endpoint uh, protection, like half the stuff out there just ignores WMI communications, which is crazy because like, that's what I defaulted to before PowerShell came around. It's like exploiting WMI, just as Windows management instrumentation. It's just, it's a way of sending commands back and forth to systems. And like everything monitors PS and exact, and this ignores WMI, which is like effectively the same thing. Um, one of my favorite things, um, just real quick, is this uh, RID, Ridenu. Um, Dave Kennedy wrote this, and all it does is just uh, use a null session to connect to um, systems and dump every username within the environment and just hand it to you. Uh, so then you have that, and you can just start and just throw that back at your brute forcing system and just you know, keep going to town. You should have your brute forcing and password cracking going nonstop through this entire process all the time, just generating more and more accounts so that like, if you accidentally burn one, you get locked out of one you're using, you have a backstop of ones you can just go keep using, and it's just churning them out. It's just generating creds for this environment. Um, Mail Sniper can do that too. You can just be like, give me all the AD stuff. And it just goes, here you go, here's 14,000 usernames. Um, and 3% of them have a password of fall 17. Let's, let's go. Um, SMB null sessions are really fun to exploit because you can get all kinds of weird stuff um, that's just sitting out there. A null session means like you just you use no creds and you connect to a system by SMB and it's just set to allow that to happen which I don't know why you guys do that, but you do this constantly. There's gotta be something out there that just does that by default for some reason. And I haven't been able to figure out what it is, but it's out there. And so you just you use, this, there's just tons of tools that can do SMB connections. One of my favorites is Crack, Crack Map Exec, it's called CME. And again, I'll have all these tools in the slide deck later, you guys can take pictures or whatever. Um, Crack, Map is, Crack Map Exec is just freaking devastating. It's an awesome tool. You can set it to go find all null session SMB servers that are out there and uh, see what there is to see, see what you can dump out of there. Like sometimes you can even like connect to DCs with, with null sessions and like dump password policies and things like that. Like people set their, their uh, AD setup to just allow like unauthenticated users to get all kinds of information about the domain. Um, you can find just straight up SMB shares with, with no auth setup on them that have plain text password files just sitting in there because it's like, oh, that's the company's file dump. Just make yourself a folder in there and just store whatever. And you go in there and there's like 400,000 files. Um, but then you just start searching for text like passwords and you come across stuff. You start looking for code snippets that have keys built into them. That's a personal favorite. I find that a lot. People, like devs will hard code keys into their, their code snippets just because they're like, oh, it's dev, it's fine. I'll, I'll fix it when we go to prod. But they don't, rotate the keys when they go to prod. So like I pull your keys out of your dev code, now I have SSH keys for all of your prod systems. And they reuse the keys across everything. Um, so just like you should be doing that, but looking for this stuff. Um, moving on, my absolute favorite tool right now is Bloodhound. This is the most cheatery bullshit ever made next to the one that's after this. <laughs> um, so like, we're in the environment, we're, we're able to talk to computers, um, we're able to log into desktops, into workstations because we have valid user creds. We have not done anything suspicious aside from the initial scans and brute forcing. Like we, 
we've logged in to the VPN using valid credentials. No alert gets set up there because, I mean, you can if you have the time for that, uh, but generally you don't alert on that. You should be alerting on things like anytime uh, a DA logs in, anytime a domain admin logs in for any reason, you should absolutely get an alert that you do IR. But like an average user, no. Um, DA accounts shouldn't be allowed to even use the VPN. But they, they are. Um, Bloodhound uh, saves us the time of having to figure out what our path to DA is going to be, assuming that our goal in this is to get domain admin because then it's usually game over at that point. Um, what you used to have to do in the past was be like, all right, I'm in, I'm on a computer, let's see who else is logged into this computer. Hopefully there's an admin. All right, let's start doing AD queries to other computers and see who's logged in there. Let's see, uh, and we'll use CraftMap exec to do SMB queries and see who's logged in where and hope that they're, they have some kind of elevated access. And you'd be like, all right, I can use the creds I have from this computer to log into that system. And so I'll hop over here and then be like, all right, cool. Um, this guy's an IT admin and he's logged in. Can I go into memory and steal his credentials? And, okay, yeah, but now I have these. What else can we get into? And you're kind of hopping around and you don't know, like you know where the DCs are, but you usually can't log directly into those because you need to be a member of the domain admin account uh, group to log into the DC. And you don't know who that is. And you're just doing a lot of hopping around or you're doing a lot of manual AD and SMB queries. And it usually took a lot of time. Somebody made this tool called Bloodhound, which does all of that for you. It's all like one PowerShell script. Uh, and it just, long story short, just spits these out. And I know you can't see it so well, but it just like, it gives you a list of users, like here's all the domain admin group, like here's all the users that are in there, and you can just start keeping an eye out for that. It gives you a literal path from like where you're at to a domain admin account to the DC. So you just know exactly where to hop here because it goes, all right, so this, this user is also logged into this computer which also has this user logged in, which is logged into that computer. And you just take advantage of like these, these user session, sessions or pulling threads from memory or whatever you want to do. And computer hop on a direct path, it's like, who plays play Parcheesi? Remember Parcheesi? Like the easiest board game ever? Where like, like the deal with Parcheesi was like, you roll the dice and you're like, I got a seven. And then you just move your thing seven. And then it's the next player's turn. And they just roll the dice and go, I rolled nine. And now I'm in the lead. And then there's the entire game until somebody got all the way around the board. That's what this is like. It's just like, all right, well, I'll just go from this computer and then this computer and then this computer. And like, you're done in like half the time that it used to take. And the best part about this is like, okay, yeah, you do have to run a PowerShell script on, uh, on some local machine in the network. It doesn't require any kind of elevated privileges. You can run this script on a completely unprivileged user's computer. And because all it does is make valid uh, AD requests that these computers and users do need to be able to do to get through their day. Um, it doesn't require any crazy privileges and it just comes back with this huge map. Like this one here, like this is this is a tiny enterprise down here at the bottom. And like there's like a trillion paths to DA on there. Um, if, if you run it in your environment and you give all your users local admin, it's it's it takes forever to render. Because it's just like do anything you want. <laughs> you screwed your environment already. So Bloodhound is awesome. Um, usually what you'll do, like once you're inside of a system, is you're going to run Mimikatz. Who does Mimikatz? Like Mimikatz is like, great, That's, which is awesome. Um, Mimikatz is, among other things, that's how you get these users' passwords out of memory when they're logged in. Um, at least that's what we're using it for in this context. Uh, so you'll get into a system, you'll run Mimikatz one way or another, uh, and then you'll get the stuff and leave. Um, generally, you like, Mimikatz is so well known that most endpoint production is going to catch it and uh, cut it off. So uh, what you'll do is you just dump LSAS and uh, just right click on the process, dump LSAS and uh, run Mimikatz offline. So you do have to be able to exfil that dump, which is often extremely easy because nobody's protecting against that stuff either. Uh, then you run Mimikatz and then you just like, then you have these user passwords and the idea is you keep doing that until you get to a system where you find a domain admin who's logged in, you grab his credentials, and then you can log into a DC, et cetera. Um, so all that's really cool. Um, this is the most cheatery bullshit that I've seen in a very long time. This is the final tool that we're going to use in this attack chain here. Um, and who knows Empire, PowerShell Empire? PowerShell Empire is kind of, it's kind of like, it's like Metasploit uh, shells 
in a PowerShell format. It's got a few exploits that it supports. Um, it's really handy because, no, again, nobody's defending against PowerShell threats, and I have no idea why. Like, PowerShell is, like, the best pen tester tool ever created and installed by default on every Windows system. It's so easy, and, like, nobody limits it. Um, everybody, like, just has it set to default where you can just, like, bypass all the execution policies and just run whatever the fuck you want because nobody uses PowerShell, so we don't have to monitor it. Does, does, your, does the average user need PowerShell to do their job? No. Like the average just like desk worker? No. Turn it off. Just fucking turn it off. Like don't even worry about writing policies for it. Just turn it off. Like that shoots me in the foot so hard when there's not PowerShell on the system now. So do that. But anyways, the power. That's kind of, Empire sets up shells on systems. DevStar takes care of the exploitation once you have that shell on a system. Um, it is like literally a one click, just like once you got a shell, you fire up Death Star and you leave and come back and you have DA. You can put it on any system, privileged, unprivileged, like regardless of who's logged in, if you can get an Empire shell to run on that system, you run Empire and it does, it does Bloodhound, it does Mimic Cats, it does all the stuff I just showed you on its own. It iterates through the tap types trying to see what works. Uh, and then it just like you come back later. And it's like, found, found domain admin, uh, uh, got domain admin credentials, username, password, here you go. And then like, it's fun because you literally go get a sandwich, you go get a coffee or whatever, you come back and you're like, oh, I win, me. <laughs> this is like the cheater automation crap that like people use for video games, but it's real life and it's pen testing. So just real quick, how to defend against that. Um, responder, disable all of these services, almost nothing in an enterprise ever needs these. These are just... A lot of them are legacy, but they're out there still running. Um, SMB signing, nobody does. SMB signing like destroys a lot of the SMB man in the middle stuff that I do. Um, there's a there's a thing called spoof spotter, which is supposed to catch like one of the things responder does. I haven't tried it, but like really the thing it's catching is something you probably don't need in your environment anyway. So again, just turn it off. Like don't worry about rules, just turn it off if you don't need it. Um, don't allow no sessions for SMB WLI. Scan your environment to find them. And then if you do need them, like set ingress rules, like set ACLs on that system, you know, set up IP tables or whatever to only allow certain connections at certain times and certain people or whatever. Don't just like have these null sessions out there that are just like YOLO because you don't know what you can get from a null session. It may look like nothing's on that system, but you may be able to exploit what that system could be using that null session to do something else. Um, Bloodhound. You should absolutely be running Bloodhound in your environment as a defender. Blood, Bloodhound is probably the best tool out right now for uh, locking down your environment. It's great because it shows you like where all the admins are logged in, who has a local admin account. You can track like how long, like where people are just staying, leaving their DA accounts logged in forever. You can find the DA logged into like some printer and be like, what the fuck is that? What are you doing? I, I found it. It's a thing. Um, you can... Like you should alert on anomalous traffic, like a ton of requests going to single DC, like Bloodhound's insanely noisy, so you can learn on that. Um, set query limits on the DC, that might break stuff. But like you'd have to like know what's a normal amount of queries for your environment to build. Um, I saw a tool called Javelin that came out, it was mentioned on um, Security Weekly, that allegedly was built just to defeat, defend against Bloodhound and it provides um, obfuscated results to Bloodhound queries. Like it recognizes it as a Bloodhound query and it sends like wrong information, which would just, I would hate that if I come across, I'd be so mad. I haven't seen it work. I couldn't find much info on it. I didn't put the website on a slide. Um, Mimicat, super easy. Um, when you dump a process, you don't get to pick the name of it. Windows automatically makes process name.dmp. So just look for that. Look for lss.dmp. As soon as you see that hit the disk, like red alert. Red fucking alert. If you see lss.dmp anywhere in your environment, someone is in, there's no reason this should ever be happening, um, in, in the exception of like some like serious troubleshooting going on with somebody. But like that should be all hands on deck, something seriously wrong there. Um, and stop giving everyone the dog local admin. Start pushing back. Stop making voices about it. And if they do need local admin, give them a separate account to use that has local admin. Should not be their daily driver account. Lock, lock it down so that like even that local admin account is only able to execute certain tasks. Like, this is really easy. This is basic like 101 sysadmin shit that nobody does because we're 
not so much lazy as we are overworked as sysadmins. Your sysadmins are insanely overworked. And don't just think that like they suck and they're lazy and they're stupid. It's that they have way too much work and they're going to do lazy stuff like just, oh, just give him root. Just give him root. He's smart. It's fine. And it's not a matter of like, is he going to do something dumb with root? It's, am I going to do something dumb with his root? And that's where the problems come in. Um, went over all of that. So, uh, end of the slide deck, I have all the tools coming in. But uh, anyway, I'm Giant Christmas. I hope that was helpful. I hope you guys can take this back to work on Monday and start running a bunch of tools and start locking your environment down. Like I said, if you can clean up everything that I mentioned here, you're going to have one seriously pissed off, cost effective pen tester because he's going to actually have to do real work instead of all this bullshit that I showed you guys today. So, uh, thank you. Enjoy.